What's the difference between weathering and erosion? rocks will eventually weather and erode away. But what's the difference between the two? Well, in a nutshell, weathering is the process by which the physical properties of the rock are changed, and erosion is the subsequent removal of the rock after it's fragmented. So let's dig in and take a look. The physical properties of a rock can be altered in one of two weathering related processes. Uh, mechanical weathering occurs when the rock is broken down into smaller and smaller pieces by mechanical action. The two most common being pressure release and frost action. In pressure release mechanisms, large igneous bodies that have crystallized deep in the earth under tremendous pressures will begin to crack and break apart once that pressure is released and the granite expands at the earth's surface. This expansion will cause cracks to form parallel to the granite's surface. Now, now these cracks eventually break into large flattish pieces breaking away from the main body and this is called exfoliation. It often also resembles the peeling of an onion where the layers are removed from the outside in. Yosemite's Half Dome is a well-known example of pressure release weathering. The other major mechanical weathering mechanism is related to the freeze and thaw cycles of ice. Uh, joints and cracks in rocks are pulled apart when trapped rainwater expands as it freezes. Uh, this process is called frost wedging, and this continues on and off over an entire season, but eventually will break the rock apart. Chemical weathering is different than mechanical weathering. In chemical weathering, the actual minerals of the rock are transformed into other chemical products. This is called rock decomposition. You've probably seen examples of this at the local cemetery. Marble tombstones, for example, will tend to appear more worn, have rounded edges, and the words will be less visible the older they are. Uh, this process of decomposition occurs when water mixes with carbon dioxide, producing carbonic acid. Since water and carbon dioxide are relatively abundant, both in the atmosphere and at the Earth's surface, it doesn't take long for minerals such as marble and calcite to dissolve away. Okay, so far we've only discussed weathering, so let's talk about erosion. Mechanical and chemical weathering often work together to decompose and break down the parent rock into fragments of all different sizes. But erosion hasn't occurred until these fragments are plucked up and transported. The most common agents of erosion are water, ice, and wind, but the effects of moving water are the most important. Moving water in the forms of streams and rivers and even rainfall will easily pluck up weathered rock fragments, some of which can be the size of houses or smaller than a pinhead. Never underestimate the power of moving water. Okay, it's time now for our creation fact of the week. Did you know that weathering and erosion can occur at astonishing rates? Uh, remember, weathering is defined as the breaking down of parent rock. Don't get sidetracked into thinking that weathering is always a slow process. Uh, this huge canyon in Idaho, for example, was weathered and eroded in just a few weeks when an Ice Age lake catastrophically burst its banks. Keep in mind that this uh, local flood cut through several hundred feet of solid basalt all in just a few weeks. Uh, now, this seems difficult for us to grasp today because weathering and erosion on this scale simply doesn't happen. But in a Christian worldview, many of the geologic features we see today resulted from past catastrophic geologic activity. And no, I don't just mean the flood of Noah. Catastrophes, the likes of which we've never experienced, would have been quite common in both the pre-flood and post-flood worlds. Uh, let's be careful not to just say, the flood did it. Uh, this canyon is a great example of a catastrophic geological condition that had nothing to do with the flood at all. Our verse is 2 Peter 3, 3 through 6. And Peter says this, Knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing. Following their own sinful desires, they will say, Where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. 
for they deliberately overlook this fact that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God, and that by means of these the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. Now importantly, Peter is not asking his opponents to don boots, hat and pick, travel to the nearest quarry and study the strata in search of evidence for Noah's flood. Nor is Peter uh, rebuking these people because they believe in naturalistic uniformitarianism. In context, Peter's opponents don't believe in God's universal judgment as it is described in the scriptures. This is what has escaped their notice. In other words, they don't have faith in God's word or they're simply not reading it. Uh, now, although these verses do not directly teach a non-uniformitarian view of nature, they do imply this. In a very real sense, Peter's naysayers are completely entrenched in an eschatological sort of uniformitarianism. They are relying on their experience of the present to tell them something about the way God dealt with humans in the past. Instead, Peter says humans need to rely on God's word to tell them these things. Now, we can make a direct application then to uniformitarian thinking in nature. If there was a global cataclysmic flood that affected just about every natural system on earth, then uh, Christians must believe the scriptures and recognize that sort of calm and stable forces of nature that work in the present cannot be read back into the geologic past. Peter is essentially saying that believers should reject a naturalistic uniformitarian view of the world that is solidly entrenched in our current experience of nature. And they should instead accept the biblical accounts that discuss God's judgment in terms of geologically non-uniform processes. Okay, well, that's it from me, Dr. C, with Creation Geology for Beginners. Uh, for more resources, you can uh, sort of read my book, and you can also visit my website, www.creationunfolding.com. And finally, please don't forget to hit the subscribe button for easier access to future videos. Thank you, and goodbye.